Greetings all. Welcome to the last scheduled talk in the year long series of presentations and activities hosted by the Rockport Earth Day 2020 subcommittee. This talk on the marvels and mysteries of Rockport's eels will be available on the Rockport Conservation Commission's website and also on Doc Waller's Earth and Space Reports YouTube channel. I'm Bill Waller, host of these reports. Our presenter for this evening is Eric Hutchins. And um, I'm going to get his bio up. This is what I'd like to say. Eric Hutchins is the Gulf of Maine Habitat Restoration Coordinator for the NOAA or NOAA Restoration Center located in Gloucester, Massachusetts. In this capacity, he has provided technical and financial assistance to over 300 habitat restoration projects throughout the Gulf of Maine, including dozens of dam removals and fish ladders. He has been employed by the National Marine Fisheries Service since 1993. Eric has a Bachelor of Science degree in fisheries and wildlife biology and a master's degree in marine affairs from the University of Rhode Island. Eric has worked as both a commercial fisherman and government biologist on domestic and foreign fishing vessels throughout the Northeast and Alaska. And so without further ado, I'm going to um, make sure that uh, everything is okay. And I, I, I think you're, you're free to go, Eric. Thank you, Bill, I appreciate it. Thank you for that introduction. Uh, just so everybody knows, um, we're not super tech savvy on this end, so I'm only looking at my screen. I'm not seeing the chat box or any of the other things associated with, with Zoom this evening. I'm not sh quite sure why. I did a one hour Zoom call all around the world today with people from Kenya, Netherlands, Sweden, Finland, Korea, and that worked perfectly. And I got to see everybody, and, and, uh, but I'm not sure why not tonight, but that's okay, we'll make this work. Um, this is a talk um, that certainly is local oriented, but has, has um, um, certainly ramifications region and, and, and certainly worldwide. And that's why I have this associated with the World Fish Migration Day. As many of you know, um, I've helped promote a number of events in Rockport associated with World Fish Migration Day in the past uh, few years. And World Fish Migration Day in 2020 got a little um, messed up, just like everything else that got messed up this year. And, and I wanted to do an uh, in the field event this year that did not happen. And I'm actually making this my World Fish Migration Day event uh, that was originally supposed to take place in May. Uh, World Fish Migration Day got bounced up to October. Um, and I've chosen to uh, give you all the pleasure of seeing this talk this evening. Um, I'm gonna, I have quite a few slides. I'm gonna interweave eels with Millbrook. So truly this, this talk is focused on Millbrook and American eels um, over a close to 20 years. So I'm gonna fit a lot of material in. I've got just over 50 slides. Um, I'll try to keep this roughly to about 40 minutes or so, leaving some time for questions and answers at the end. And onward, hopefully, the, uh, next slide. Marvels and Mysteries of Rockport's Eels. Just a quick outline. I'm gonna give a little introduction about myself, a little bit, uh, a little bit of background. Um, basic biology, basic life history, a little bit of management of American eels. I'm gonna talk a little bit about the Mill Pond Dam failure, an opportunity in disguise, I like to call it. Um, you know, when there's lemons, you make lemonade. Um, Counting eels in Millbrook, which is uh, something I've, I've led up now for a number of years, I think starting in 2013 with, I assume some of the people on this call, as well as um, lo lots of volunteers. Uh, we can't hear you, Eric, all of a sudden. You, you seem to have dropped out. Are you still there? Earth to Eric. Uh, 
Um, for those of you who don't know, I was actually born in Rockport, uh, 1962. And this is a photograph of my grandmother and grandfather. They, were, they lived here as well, as did my, my mother. Um, my grandfather was a big swimmer. I'm always told the story how he swam out to the breakwater for a $2 bet years and years ago. He was just an unbelievable swimmer. He was a lobsterman. And as a, um, he came here from Sweden um, to cut granite. He was a stonesmith, a stonemason. Um, this interesting photo that you're looking at right there, that's not a tuna fish, unfortunately. Um, I am Scandinavian background, that's a harbor porpoise. Um, my grandmother's not looking too happy. My grandfather, I think, was probably pretty proud and probably enjoyed eating it, but um, no more of that, but that's a little bit of my background. Um, my work today, um, I work, I, I, for years now doing a lot of volunteer work in Rockport on boards and committees, um, as well as just trying to implement projects that are good, good for our environment. That's truly my focus um, in life is trying to restore it and provide good stewardship of the marine environment, as well as our woodlands um, and freshwater wetlands. As uh, Bill mentioned, I've worked for the NOAA Restoration Center for um, uh, well, since about 19, what, 1995, but I've been with a national marine fishery since 93 and most, mostly working these days on dam removals. So my day-to-day my -day job is doing everything I can to remove a dam Interestingly enough, except in my hometown. So that's kind of the irony of this talk. Uh, the place I live, we rebuilt a dam and we did a good job at it and we're doing the best we can with it, both for the marine environment and the public. And I'll touch on that further. Okay, eels. So I'm gonna first start you off with a nice little photograph of a life stage of an eel that I've never seen. It's the leptocephalus stage, larval stage just after their eggs have hatched. Um, and it's a stage that um, took years and years to even find this stage. And, um, and, and even though people have been looking really seriously for well over a hundred years, they have still not found spawning eels in the Atlantic Ocean. They just have not found them. They have found larvae, they have found adults heading in the direction. So by a process of elimination of years and years, literally decades and millions and millions of dollars of research ships plying the Atlantic Ocean, they've narrowed down to where eels are born and where they, where they spawn is the Sargasso Sea, a big expansive area um, east and south of Bermuda. Um, so I'll show you this in a, uh, in a, in an upcoming slide. How far do they swim to, uh, to reach Rockport? Well, do the math, Sargasso Sea to Rockport, about 2,500 miles, 2,000 miles. And the, in this, in the eels that are born in this area also will make it up all the way up to Canada, Gulf of St. Lawrence, up into the Great Lakes, up to Greenland. Um, truly long distance, some of the most long distance fish that exists in, in the ocean other than, for example, bluefin tuna and some of our tuna species, the, the tiny little eels, two to three inches long. These are a couple of the questions I ask the public all the time when I'm down working on the Mill Pond Dam. How far do they swim? And I always get blank stares. People, and I, I make people guess. Someone will raise their hand and say, a mile, two miles, and I'll, I'll keep pushing them. People's eyes drop out of their head when you tell them 2,000 miles, this tiny little eel swam to get to Rockport. Then my follow-up question is how much are eels worth? I'm sure that many of you on this call know, but I'm sure there's some of you that don't. Um, but I'm gonna get to that in just a second. And these are some of those mysteries and marvel eels. Here's a, here's a diagram uh, roughly showing um, the general area. There was no exact definition of the Sargasso Sea other than this area in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean south of Bermuda. Um, it's an area that's very quiescent and um, there's not a lot of currents within it. Um, the eels are born in this area. They don't actually fully swim all the way to Rockport. They take advantage of the Gulf Stream and the currents in the Caribbean. Um, so they basically hitch a ride. The Gulf Stream in some areas is moving as much as five miles per hour. 
Um, they will take advantage of that. What makes them determined to go to Georgia? Do they go to South Carolina? Do they make it up to Rockport? Do they go into the Liberbrook in Rockport? We don't know exactly um, because they weren't born there. Um, Atlantic salmon, as many of you know, will actually return to their stream that they were born in. But these eels aren't returning to where they were born. They were born in the Sargasso Sea. Um, we just don't know exactly. The working assumption is, is random. Um, and the eel that returns to Millbrook is not coming there because his mother lived there throughout its life. We don't know for sure, and we may never know. Um, you probably can't read all this print, but I just want to give you a quick rundown of the life stages of American eels. You saw the larval stage called the leptocephalus. Glass, they, the, the, the larvae on their migration north uh, um, metamorphize into a basically a small eel called a glass eel. Many of you have heard of a glass eel. And the reason they're called glass eels is they're pretty much translucent. You can see right through them. And that's a protective measure. As they migrate through the ocean, they're translucent. Predators can't see them. As soon as they head into streams and, and hit the fresh water and hit the muddy bottom areas, they, they then metamorphize further and pick, on, pick up pigment. Um, a ghostly looking glass eel would be seen quickly in a, in a stream like Millbrook or some other, or a little river in Gloucester, but by picking up the pigment of browns and blacks, then they actually hibernate. Um, they're, in, they're camouflaged again. Um, elvers for, uh, you know, basically their first year, year and a half. Um, and then um, anything over six inches, we call a yellow eel. And pretty much eels living throughout their life in, in freshwater systems or in our tidal areas like Long Beach or, um, you know, the, the creek down at the beaches at Gloucester, they will um, be what's called the yellow phase eel. And you can kind of see in that picture, they have a, more of a yellowish bottom. Later on, when, when they decide, and we don't know exactly what cue tells an eel it's time to migrate and spawn, but when they do, they switch into what's called the silver phase eel. A um, lot of um, physiological changes. They, they eventually stop eating. They, they, um, um, eyes get a lot bigger for, for um, uh, migrating at night. And uh, at that point there, once they've switched into silver eel phase, they're heading out to migrate back to the Sargasso Sea. Um, oh, I, I spelled Anguilla rostrata wrong. My scientific name should be rostrata, not rostrate. <laughs> Sorry about that. Mm. My earlier question, how much are eels worth? Mm. Up to, actually I wrote $2,000 a pound. They actually have reached $2,500 a pound for glass oh. eels. And, and there'll be some elvers mixed in with that as well. Is pro, is mo, most likely the single most, and that's the price to a fisherman. That's not even what a retailer would pay. That's what the fisherman gets. And in some evenings, fishermen in Maine will catch as much as 10 pounds in an evening. Unbelievably lucrative. Um, only two states on the East Coast that allow harvesting of small eels, South Carolina and Maine, mostly up in Maine is where most of the poundage is caught. Massachusetts does not allow the harvest of them. You have, they have to be, I believe, greater than, I think it's 10 inches in Massachusetts, might be nine, to harvest them for eating. If you wonder, years ago, they used to harvest a lot of adult eels in Gloucester Harbor when I grew up. Um, and even back then, they probably got just a couple dollars a pound for the adult eels. The baby eels, the elvers and, the el and, and glass eels are shipped over to Asia where they grow them out in the aquaculture pens for about a year and a half to two years, I believe. And then they sell them mostly for Japanese restaurants. A lot of them actually fly back to the United States for our sushi restaurants. Um, I'm not expecting you to read this at all. But where do, where do eels live in Rockport? First of all, on the left-hand side of this, this um, slide, Sawmill Brook, which runs down to Long Beach. Uh, I'm gonna skip one, Mill Brook, which is what the bulk of this talk is about. Hullabit Point, Hullabit Point State Park is actually the location where I've seen my biggest eel ever. Eels, baby eels actually make it up through those crevices of Hullabit Point and have made it into the quarry. I think there's a good chance that there's a number of eels in there that 
have not figured out how to get out, even though they might want to leave. I've seen easily some three foot eels, almost two to two inches plus in diameter um, on the ledges. Stimson Brook, I bet there's a number of people from Rockport on this call who've never even heard of Stimson Brook. Mm -hmm. And the article to the right is about Stimson Brook. I cannot find the citation for this um, article. I believe it's from the late 1800s or early 1900s. And um, interesting article. It's um, Stimson Brook runs from where the sewage treatment plant is. There's, there's an old wetland up there that used to be um, semi-dammed off with it for an ice pond. It's all plants now. There's no pond there anymore. But there's a brook that runs down through Marshall Street down to Glock Rockport Harbor. And there was this person named Mr. Frank Hale, a blacksmith on Marshall Street. He'd been feeding eels. He could call them in. Reporters would come down from Boston to, yeah. to watch him. Um, I am listening to an interesting nature program on the local eels here. Can I call you back in a few minutes? Nope. Oh. <laughs> Great. Nope. Oh, so anyway, he was famous for um, going down to the brook, come blacky, come bluey, come brownie. He actually would call the, them in. And this is known to happen in other places around the world where there are eels. People, they actually, social intelligence to the point that people have learned to tap and they come over and people hand feed them. And that was done right here in Rockport and it was documented many times. The Millbrook Watershed. I'm going to focus in on the Millbrook Watershed. This is on the left-hand side of the screen is out in the middle of Dogtown. Briar Swamp is kind of this, one of the centers of Dogtown and the beginning of Millbrook. That red line is, is a depiction of Millbrook running through Mill, uh, through Briar Swamp, down through Loop Pond, running along the railroad tracks, then down to, down to um, Mill Pond at the Millbrook Meadow, and then down to um, Front Beach. <laughs> is the entrance to Millbrook. Um, I don't have a picture looking the other way, but directly behind this picture, you're looking at open ocean of the Atlantic Ocean, Sandy Bay. Oh, the tide, a high tide actually reaches right at that wall, right there at that opening. But that's the entrance to Millbrook. Old granite wall, old, old culvert leading up, up and underneath. I've been actually inside of that culvert many times and I've crossed through to the other side. A Little bit of a creepy exploration but um, there's often lots of adult eels in there. And I once went face to face, about two feet away inside of that culvert to a beaver who was building a dam inside the culvert. Um, <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not sure who was more scared, him or me. I've never been that close to a beaver, dead on face to face. Anyway, this is the, where the eels enter, right up into Millbrook. And you know, I've always been interested in Millbrook and this was a um, little bit of some in, in, intrigue for for myself. And this is Millbrook as well, looking upstream. And this is what got my initial, some, some of my initial interest in Millbrook with the eels was back in 2004, working with the Rockport Department of Public Works and my wife, and we were studying uh, stormwater and other discharges to Millbrook. So we had to walk the brook end to end with hip waders on, looking for pipes. And as part of that study, we actually found 35 pipes discharging to Millbrook. Um, some of them were squirting at us, some of them were huge and nothing, kinds of different stuff. We were looking for opportunities to protect and reduce pollution reaching Millbrook. The reason it's green, that's not algae. That's actually dye that we put in the middle of Evans Field to see where the, uh, a drain that we knew of in Evans Field where it came out. We put dye in Evans Field, we put dye in some of the park, he has any plans and knows how these pipes work. So this was part of our effort to figure out some of the issues with Millbrook. But while walking up and down the brook, looking for the pipes, I found lots of eels, little squiggling around my feet. I saw quite a few of them. So that was kind of the inception of my interest to dig a little bit deeper into eels in Mill Rockport's Millbrook. <clears throat> then further downstream, that earlier picture was up near IGA, the, um, uh, well, the market. Um, then this is further downstream. And this has been really the center attraction for many years for many reasons. The Mill Pond Dam down by Millbrook Meadow, right down by Front Beach. Um, I show you this picture. It's a, actually a beautiful picture um, from a number of years ago. That's 
the old dam that we're looking at there with the trees there. This dam had a number of issues and part of it is it was so old. Parts of this dam certainly go back to the 1700s. It's been repaired a number of, you know, probably minor repairs over the years, but for all practical purposes, this is the original, well, the, I believe it was the second <laughs> mill dam at this site, but it had issues. Those two little openings that look like eyes, all of this watershed over a square mile has to squeeze through those two openings. So it's called discharge capacity. And this dam did not have enough discharge capacity. It's construction, very little concrete at all. Much of it was dry laid stone on top of stone with a core of gravel. Um, this was not a cement dam. It was relatively extreme, well, extremely weak. Um, wasn't properly maintained over the years and decades and very few people do maintain dams properly. That's part of the reason I have a lot of work these days. And it had, the reason I, I say limited fish passage, eels did make it over the dam. Because it was such an old dam, it had lots of crevices and leakages. Baby eels can take advantage of those situations. And for hundreds of years, they've been making it over the Mill Pond Dam. I'm sure many of them died trying, but many of them could make it over. Could you give me some water? But the Mother's Day flood came along, 2006, May 16th and 17th. Um, this is Pools Lane under almost a foot of water right there. We had 12 inches of rain. I believe in uh, some estimates were up to 16 inches over the two days. Uh, certainly a 100 year plus storm event that um, overwhelmed the capacity of pretty much everything. Roads, culverts, stormwater discharges, our sewage treatment plant, pretty much everything got overwhelmed. It was enjoyable to watch, but it was also very sad too, the damage. I'm looking at the Mill Pond Dam right here on the, the, for the Mother's Day flood. Uh, the swans were loving it. You're looking at the dam in the background. That's the walkway right there where that pole is. Everything was underwater. And I was going down here continuously, very nervous about the shape of the dam and its potential to fail. Um, there were some sandbags left in the openings so that even that minimal capacity was even partially blocked off. So I went down, as this was happening probably three or four times a day, it was overtopping the dam and shredding the meadow. On the right-hand side of this photo is the walkway that leads down to Front Beach. So much water left the stream, which is off to the left-hand side of this photo, and created its own stream bed right down the walkway and shredded it to about two feet deep, almost made it a whole new river. People joked and said it looked like its own fish ladder. And then it finally went. The, um, the dam failed. It was not what we call a complete failure, even though that looks pretty complete. The entire guts of the dam blew out, the front wall caved in, the downstream wall caved in, but the upstream side of the dam, for the most part, held together. And there was a lot of debate whether to open it up and just let it go because it was, it was thought it was gonna just catastrophically open up, which would have sent maybe 2000 cubic yards of sediment and an awful lot of water smashing down onto Beach Street. The call was made to stabilize it in place rather than letting it go. But um, it was quite a mess, suffice to say. But I'm not here to totally talk about the dam issue. I'm just gonna bounce back to eels. So the, with the dam failure, we knew something had to be done, whether the dam was rebuilt, whether the dam was removed, the stream was restored. And I, I reached out to the Massachusetts Division of Marine Fisheries for them to put an eel trap in Millbrook. And this is downstream about hundred feet up from uh, Beach Street. And this is called a Sheldon trap. We put this in for three years. It's just a passive trap, fish swimming up from downstream, um, just swim inside of it and get trapped inside of it. Um, we had a number of volunteers that worked with me. We checked it every day for a couple of years and boy, we did not catch many eels in it. I One year, I think we had zero uh 20 um 12 the thing was heavy it was hard to use we were just guessing that the eels were swimming around it because almost any day i could get on the beach and catch an eel within one minute digging around in the sand they just were not going in this trap 
Um, so anyway, we had that in for a few years while the town was debating on what to do with the Mill Pond Dam, whether to keep it, to save it, to fix it, uh, change it, restore stream. We were collecting data, pre-restoration data uh, for what they were going to do in the future at the dam site. Big coalition of partners over the years, and this is you know over over fifteen over fifteen well over ten years now. Uh, the groups that have been working together, looking at eels and looking at uh, the issues in in Lower Millbrook, in particular the Rockport DPW, the Millbrook Meadow Committee, who has sponsored my work in any way they can. Um, I try to help them and they've certainly helped me and it's been a great partnership. The Rockport Middle School and High School has been down to Millbrook just about every year for the past decade to come down and learn about fish and turtles and birds and streams, water quality. Toad Hall Bookstore, which sadly doesn't exist anymore, actually provided the starter grant of $500 that allowed us to purchase equipment to monitor eels in Millbrook. And we've taken that $500 and now got almost 10 years worth of work out of it. Essex Tech students have come down from Middleton um, to uh, students from all over the North Shore because it's such a great site for uh, students to learn about both the ocean, a pond and a stream all within the same walking distance. Cape Ann Vernal Pond Team um, has been there helping us with turtles and fish. Uh, um, Kestrel, obviously Noah, who I work with, the Massachusetts Division of, Mean, Division of Marine Fisheries, and I am certainly missing many and many individuals. So it's been a real collaboration uh, with many partners over the years. I'm tempted to say in probably more percentage of people in Rockport know about eels than maybe any town in Massachusetts. <laughs> <laughs> um, dozens of outreach events over these years. Uh, just to kind of give you a little snapshot in that lower left-hand picture, that's how many students we'd have uh, two days a year in May from the Rockport Middle School. All the middle school students, it was actually part of their curriculum. They would come, they would come down to the, um, Millbrook Meadow. Um, I would do a talk about eels in the watershed. Other biologists would talk about water quality. We would talk about the history of Mill Pond. We would talk about all kinds of parameters. Then we would try to find them animals and creatures and um, show them as much as we possibly could, rain or shine. Um, on the right-hand side, we've always taken advantage of um, outreach events. The, that's uh, Senator Bruce Tarr, um, and along with Paul Murphy in the uh, foreground, um, releasing the, uh, eels. So we would catch eels downstream um, or in the trap and at, at one point, bringing them up over the dam to, to allow them to get up into Mill Pond and farther up Mill, up, up Mill Brook. And you know what better opportunity? Have that bucket ready and um, make sure that Bruce Tarr knows about eels and let him do the release. Uh, um, and if, next time any of you see Bruce, you can ask him about eels and he knows a lot about them now. I can promise you that. <laughs> so he's, he's a steward himself. Um, but you take a look at this picture. This is probably one of the single best pitches I have of any of the students from Rockport. Um, actually, she's out of Rockport school system. This was many years ago. Um, probably the biggest smile I've seen of anyone um, just enjoying a full adult size eel that we caught in Millbrook, um, not hesitating one bit. Um, and um, you know, we, we actually, we let her let that eel go above the dam. But that's how you, that's how you create future biologists that's how you create future stewards of the, the watershed, the Millbrook and Mill Pond. She'll never forget that day. Oh, so back to the dam. They ripped it out. I, this is not all about the dam gone and rebuilding, so I'm just showing you this one picture. You saw it before, now it's gone. No dam at all. Matter of fact, you don't even see any stream. The stream is all running through a pipe. It's bypassed. Um, and during the reconstruction of the dam, we um, obviously eels were not making it upstream effectively through the stream or over the dam. There was no way for them to make it. So this is at the point where we, any dams, any eels that we were catching, we were hand bucketing upstream to make sure they made it by this construction site. It was a big battle to figure out whether to rebuild the dam or not. I will be perfectly honest. I advocated this would have been a great dam removal project. Um, but it wasn't a critical one because the kind of species that in particular needed to migrate upstream can be effectively um, transferred with a fish ladder. 
um, with the eel ladder. Um, and a lot of other extremely nice attributes of habitat restoration, both social and biological parameters were restored here. So, you know, um, it's rebuilt and it's, and uh, we're making it work. Dam construction impacts. <laughs> so this is rebuilding of a dam. Um, whether you remove a dam or rebuild it, there's a lot of impacts. Had to rip out the entire old dam, dewater the pond. That's the pond um, sediment cracking like a desert in your foreground and with almost no water left inside, uh, upstream in the pond, very little, just enough to keep some of those fish that were in there alive and no eel passage during this point. But with that new dam, um, I chimed in a little bit and as did others, rebuilding of this dam that received federal emergency management agency funding along with state money. Um, I, I, really, I pointed out that a new dam that was gonna have a solid concrete core and no longer leak would for all practical purposes, stop all those eels that have been swimming upstream for the past couple of hundred years. And every, all the funders agreed and as part of the funding of this project, um, an eel ladder was included in the design. Um, a rel you know, um, only at, at the time, there was only a few eel, matter of fact, this is the only eel ladder at the time that I knew of in Massachusetts that had been funded by FEMA. There may be more now. Um, they're catching on as there's others that it's not just salmon and river herring that need to get upstream or American shad, eels need a pathway up as well. And um, basically they don't swim up. If you look on the picture on the right-hand side, it's basically like an AstroTurf type material called ECMAT. And it's a woven plastic material. They wiggle their way up through the mesh. All we oh my do God. is try to give them a little bit of water, just enough water to swim upstream. They, they, through the mesh, they're not actually swimming. Along with, this is actually what the Toad Hall Bookstore grant was used for. Might not have ever seen one of these things before unless you've been down there, but that was our new trap. We did not like the old trap. It didn't seem to catch a lot of eels. And this was an opportunity to try a new design that had been designed by the Division of Marine Fisheries. A real simple approach. The green around it and PVC pipe floats it and water from the pond goes through the black tube and goes into that eel ladder the eel passes that you just saw. No pumps, strictly gravity. Joe Parisi said, I don't want to have to manage a pump down there and I don't blame him. Joe's the DPW director, who in the end is responsible for all this infrastructure. <clears throat> Division of Marine Fisheries came down and helped us install the new uh, innovative floating trap. That's the upstream side of the dam, a board in front of it, and if you look just inside the culvert, that's the top end of the fish ladder. Um, so this attaches to it. The eels would swim up the ladder through that mesh. Water would be going down the trap, which is the attraction flow. And then they get caught inside of this floating trap. Once we installed the trap, I believe that we, it didn't get in until two, uh, July, it was late. We, we were pushing to have it in. The, the very first day, I went down the next day after this picture was taken. I was so excited to tell everyone we caught an eel the very first day. And we ended up catching 30 that year. We caught more on the tail end of the eel run uh, than we had caught downstream for three years with the old Sheldon trap. 2015, um, and this is, the, the, we are looking at the trap from April 1st to Columbus Day. That's our period of the year that we look for eels. We don't find it many at all in early April, but we do see a few still towards the end of October, but these are the migration season period. We're trying to cover it as, as, as well as we can to make sure we're not missing any. 2015, we've got 603. Interestingly enough, the next year, checking it every single day for that period, all we found was 10 eels. They just chose not to go to Rockport that year. Um, this is just one of the signs we had down there, the, par the primary partners, NOAA, Town of Rockport, Commonwealth of Massachusetts. You know, whenever you put equipment in a stream, you want people to have a little idea what's going on. Um, you know, tell people don't tamper with it. 
And we've had these traps in now since 2013. I am not aware of a single tampering of these traps. And I attest that to the outreach to the neighbors, Millbrook Meadow Committee, everybody else, and it's a very visible site. Everyone around there, I get phone calls. Hey, someone was down there looking at this. I get questions all the time, but it's a fantastic place to do monitoring. Every time you get on there, you get an audience. Anytime someone's down there, one of the neighbors is often looking at them, keeping an eye out on things. So I want to thank all of the people that have helped keep an eye out on the equipment down there. Uh, pretty rare for any biologist to have equipment in the field for almost 10 years now with no vandalism of any kind. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> um, Ma Eel Ranch throughout Massachusetts, not that many. If you look at this chronological order, we were number one, we were number seven in the state with an eel trap. Um, there's quite a few more now. We're up to about 12 or 13, but um, this is relatively new. The first one, which I was involved with as well, on the Saugus River, was only installed in 2007. We've been studying codfish for practically 100, over 100 years um, for fisheries management. We have not done much of anything with eels until recent decade plus. Um, and this is for a species that garners as much as $2,500 a pound. So we have a lot of catch up to do for this species. And sadly, we're um, not in great shape because their stocks are extremely low. 2017, this was our big year. And this is that bucket on your right hand side, that photo is one day's worth of eels. Uh, we check it once a day, whoever the intern or the volunteer is that day, they can check it anytime they want. And lo and behold, the phone was ringing off the wall that day. We went from something like 20 eels one day, 30 the next, over 500 eels the next day. That wasn't my day, but I got the phone call and I ran right down there. But the 2017 was the year that they were gonna dredge the pond. So first they rebuilt the dam, then they were gonna dredge the material out of the dam and they did it in 2017. So in 2017, all of these eels that we caught were not put back into Mill Pond. We drove them up to Loop Pond and released them up there. We got some nice coverage from the Gloucester Times. Before they dredged it, we were transferring all the eels. We were setting turtle traps, fish traps. We even snuck in a few frogs that we found to make sure that they were protected as well because the dredging of the entire pond was gonna certainly be dangerous to anybody that was still living in there. <clears throat> Just taking a sip of water. I was doing a little too much snow shoveling today. <clears throat> Salvage begins 2017. As the water level was dropped, our charge was to go catch as many fish, turtles, um, before all the water was gone. It was kind of fun, but it was pretty muddy. That There were places where that mud, you would sink in three to four feet if you weren't careful. And I mean, it was dangerous. You could sink right up higher than your waist. And they were also contaminated sediments. So you really didn't want the stuff smudged all over you. A um, lot of oils and grease and other nasty things from upstream. So we set our traps. Um, we got students involved. We got Cape Ann Vernal Pond team. We brought down every piece of equipment you could think of. We set minnow traps. We brought seine nets. We brought turtle traps, dip nets. Students with their hands flipping buckets, any way we could catch fish in, in Mill Pond because we wanted to get them up to Loop Pond before they dewatered it and dredged it. It was a lot of fun, but it was a lot of work. The turtle traps on your right hand side. On your right, um, all the, uh, we measured all the turtles, we measured all the fish, we figured out the species. Um, we marked even the turtles. We put a little uh, mark on them. So we actually, if we catch them again, we could actually look at them. Luckily we haven't caught any, we're not trying to catch them. I believe we caught something like 25 painted turtles and three or four snapping turtles. Um, and they all got relocated um, up to Loop Pond. Kind of interesting having a 15 pound snapping turtle in a bucket in the back of your car. They have to then walk through the woods and release up at Loop Pond. And we knew they'd make it all back down. 
and which many of them have. <laughs> Assistance from Essex Tech. We made this an, a beautiful opportunity. We needed manpower. We needed kid power. We need student power. And they came down. Essex Tech students came down, had another student group come down all day long. They caught fish. That was their product. They came down two days in a row. They, um, fishing all day long, any way they could. They caught bass. They caught horn pelt. They caught eels. They caught baby eels, big eels, turtles, um, you name it. We, they caught more, literally there were thousands of fish that we retransplanted up to Loop Pond. We saved everything we could. We certainly didn't save everything. Um, every one of these things was a spectator event. Opening up the trap, that's the floating trap on the left-hand side, that's one of our interns. Um, piles of people wanting to see what eels came out of the trap, uh, out of the eel trap. On the right-hand side, Rick Roth showing off one of the big snapping turtles we caught, trying to not get his leg chewed off. Um, everyone was just intrigued to see all the animals, um, to see what was caught. And we did everything we could to make sure that every animal was taken care of nicely and kindly and, and taken care of. More of our student interns, uh, and it's been a great intern project. I reach out every year to the schools, um, high school students, we've had college students, um, neighbors, a um, little bit of everything. And it's a great little project for students going off to college, their junior, senior year to say they've got some real field experience um, uh, studying a species of concern like American eels. More saving fish and turtles. The neighbor, um, this was one of the ways we um, actually, that's me, um, as the water got pumped down while they were dredging, we figured out a method because <laughs> you couldn't walk, couldn't walk in it because you'd get stuck in the mud. So we put a rope on the end of the neighbor's, uh, Marty Ross's canoe launched it so I'd be safe in the canoe and dip netted fish out. So as the water was drawn down, the fish got concentrated more and more and more in one little pool in the middle. And it was dirty, muddy water. And you know it was bad for the fish. But I saved probably, after all the students were gone, hundreds more fish this way. And then let the dredging begin. Upper right corner, little bit of water left. And they're ready to start actual dredging. Left-hand side, there's no water left. Um, heavy equipment is in there. And at this point, most everything that would have been um, still in there has either been caught or probably will have died in the mud. Um, I'm not gonna um, hide the negatives. There's always collateral damage, even doing habitat restoration projects, removing dams or rebuilding dams or dredging ponds. Um, we found quite a few dead eels, um, and but I but for every one of these dead ones that I found in the mud as they were dewatering, I found dozens uh, that we saved. So I feel really good about what we saved, and take my word for it. I'm not aware of hardly any dredging projects in any ponds anywhere that I've ever worked on, where anyone actually went in the mud to save all those animals like we did in Rockport with all the volunteers. So Rockport did as good as any project I know of in New England to save everything we could. But, you know, not a nice sight. Number of the fish, just their gills got all clogged up in the mud. Um, but there is a bright side to this. Middle of the night, raccoons, probably possums, probably some cats, um, skunks, uh, great blue herons. They all come down here and feed on the, the animals that died. So no complete waste. Just don't like to see it. Um, this is a good picture. I call it contaminated slop. I think it was about 2,500 cubic yards of accumulated sediments that came from upstream that are probably 150 years of accumulation in Mill Pond they dredged out. Um, I still was poking around even in these conditions because a couple of turtles popped up even after it was dewatered. The hardest thing was getting them, getting out to them, but I found ways to get them. I saved a few more turtles. Downstream in the mill pond, uh, this is the frog pond, just 100 feet downstream from mill pond. They dredge that out as well. So this whole segment of mill brook and mill pond and frog pond has undergone major disturbance in the past couple of years as, the, as part of these efforts. to rebuild the dam, but also to install the new eel ladder, 
and to restore some of the, the nice stream habitat downstream, which has come out really nice. On the right-hand side, those are actually all live eels in a bucket that I just caught. Um, and I'm about to bring, put water on them. The eels can live out of water for quite some time, as uh, long as they stay moist, not in a bright sunny day. Uh, the eel on the left, I think he got frozen because this was in December. Some of them crawled out of the mud and then froze. So some, some of these adults did make it, but I still saved many of them. I think this was like the second week in December, poking around the mud, I found this tiny little turtle. And on the left-hand side, it was about one inch long. That's what it was like when I found him. And it was too late in the season to release this tiny turtle. Didn't feel like you'd have an opportunity to hibernate for the winter. So we, um, I spoke with some people that do, um, quote, head start programs. We decided to head start him in the winter to release him the next summer. That's actually one of the pictures in my kitchen sink. And in between those meshes are one inches, one inch each. So this is, I don't remember what point this picture was taken, but he's already two inches long. You keep them warm in the wintertime and you feed them a lot and they will grow unbelievable because normally they wouldn't be eating for five months throughout the winter. They'd be just basically hibernating. This little turtle fattened up like nothing you'd ever believe. <laughs> Here he is at my house, happy as could be. Um, I'm not sure I could ever feed him enough. He got Hamburg, he got mealy worms. Um, and even at that small size, they, they, you gotta watch out for them. Snapping turtles, even at two inches long, they're still snapping. And that, that net comes out almost a full inch to grab food, whatever you're tossing at it. Um, he was a happy guy that winter. It's my wife, Julie. She got the uh, honor of releasing the turtle. And as you can see in that left-hand picture, that turtle is plump. Um, he's got some nice uh, fat reserves that he built up at our house that winter. This is a uh, June release. We waited for the water to warm up early June um, and um, gave him the royal release back into Mill Pond. So that was at least the first turtle we know that made it back into Mill Pond, even though there's many of them back in there now. And I don't think we named that turtle. Did we name that turtle? I think it had a name. Can't remember now, but off it goes. 2018, more impacts to Millbrook. This is the lower Millbrook. And in the background of this picture, you can see the new dam. There's a little pillar sticking up. So they rebuilt the dam. First the dam failed, then they rebuilt the dam, then they dredged the pond, and then it was time to restore the lower Millbrook. So all of Millbrook is running through that plastic pipe right now while they rebuild the stream, rebuild the meadow. What they did is they took out all of the walls of this old historic um, stream that was not built for, for um, aquatic functions and values. It was built to convey water from upstream to downstream. And this was an opportunity to restore a few hundred foot um, section of Millbrook to natural habitat. Um, but you gotta go through the construction phase. Again, never pretty, um, but you gotta get there. <laughs> Looking from um, upstream to down, that's actually the Atlantic Ocean, just below the bucket of that excavator. You see that blue? That's the Atlantic Ocean, our front beach. All the water, most of the water is going down that black pipe. Um, you know, another mess. That's what happens with habitat restoration. It's usually a mess stage, um, but um, hopefully making something nice for years to come. I know that Laura Hollowell has given a talk on Millbrook, but I had to slip in and she let up. Um, a, a lot of this project. I had to slip in a couple of photos. And this is what the site looks like spring of 2019. And there are much prettier pictures than this now. A straight couple hundred foot section of Millbrook was meandered like a natural stream. All the plants that were planted on both sides are native vegetation, native wetland plants, and they're doing fantastic. And this is really, really good eel habitat, um, lots of cobbles, lots of gravel, all the things that eels like. So it's a nice inviting stream for them to make their way up to the eel ladder, make it up in the mill pond, make their way up to loop pond where they'll live 15 or 20 years. Hopefully they're most of their life out before they decide to go back to the Sargasso Sea to spawn. And then after, I didn't mention this, after they spawn the Sargasso Sea, they die, that's it. They don't come back. 
yearly eel counts, just to kind of give you a summary of what we've been finding. Uh, those first three years with the Sheldon trap, my, my notes are actually back in my office. That's why I don't have the data there, they're handwritten. There was so little, we never even put it into a spreadsheet. Um, and it was, we caught very few. Someone said one year was zero, I don't remember that, but it was less than 20 for three years in a row. 2013, we had no trap. And then we had the floating trap, 30 and 14. We had that low of two, 10 eels in 2016. When you only get 10 eels in for checking a trap with volunteers for six months, sometimes it's hard to get volunteers. It's kind of like in the Little River this year. I think they saw one river herring for all the volunteers going every single day. Um, some years the fish just don't return and we don't know why. Then it went from 10 to 1,924. This year, we had a fairly big year at 393. That's our third highest year. And next year, time will tell. Um, I always reach out for volunteers. So if there's anyone looking to do some help with eel counts next year, you can certainly reach out to me. And I'm gonna show you <clears throat> some really super pictures of American eels that were taken by an old friend of mine from the South Shore, not here. And these pictures were taken at the base of a dam that did not have eel pack, an eel ladder. These are thousands of baby elvers, glass eels, wanting to make it over a dam. And as they come in from the ocean, more and more piling up um, and just not finding a way over this dam. But just vent, you know, how many are in that picture? 300, 400, hard to say. Here they are swimming at the base of this structure. Really gives you a, just a, an, an amazing view of what, the, what these eels look like uh, in, their, in their habitat. But when you have an impediment in any animal, any species that piles up like this, that's an invitation for predators. And that's the problem. Sometimes they, even if they can make it over, but if you slow them down, there'll be raccoons here, there'll be birds. Matter of fact, anytime any of you down at Mill Pond in Rockport, if you see a grackle, a bird, a grackle hopping along the shore in the springtime, they're looking for baby eels. That's always a telltale sign that there's baby eels around is when the grackles are there feeding on them. If you look in these crevices, you can see the heads and the eyes sticking out at you. Look at that. Oh wondering how they're going to get over the structure um in a site like this probably you know somebody benefited you know the great blue herons the raccoons the grackles but it's not good for equilibrium of the environment to, ha to have an impediment of this type of nature anywhere um the objective of my work any way i can is to tr work to get these animals over impediments that we've put in place uh, get them over, let them live their life cycle out for many reasons. It's good for the natural environment. Uh, it's good for the animals themselves. Let's face it, people make a living off them as well. We have hundreds of people um, up and down the coast that actually make a living off eels. Um, and plus they taste good. This is the same site. Just the wall was covered in eels. Those little... Now the glass eels are all the white ones you see here. And you see a few that have a little bit of brown pigment. Those are elvers. And interestingly enough, only 500 feet up from Front Beach, we have never seen a complete glass eel. They all have pigment by the time we catch them in the trap in Mill Pond. So they all have a little bit mostly brown or black pigmentation. We've not caught a single translucent eel in the trap, but I catch them all the time down at Front Beach. Okay, I have a, a sad take home message that's a little off topic, but this is a picture I got this year for all you that everybody that cares about everything in Mill Pond. Um, this is one of um, everybody's uh, favorite turtles in Mill Pond. And I started getting phone calls this year about a hook in one of the turtle's mouths. As you can see it hanging out of its mouth. I fish, so I'm not gonna sit there and preach and tell people to not go fishing. But to anybody that wants to fish in Mill Pond, most people aren't eating the fish out of there. Use barbless hooks and do not use stainless steel hooks. So even if something does happen like this, 
the hook will rust out or it'll fall out. That's all. Barbless hooks, no stainless steel. And that way there we take care of the animals in Mill Pond. And I'm gonna end asking anybody if they have any questions and give you one nice reference here to a book. If you wanna learn more about eels, an extremely well-written book. It's based on the European eel that for all practical purposes has the identical life cycle of the American eel. Um, and this book is actually focused on Sweden of all places. A lot of Swedes here in Rockport, but it's a very good book. So, um, any questions from anybody? And I'll wrap it up there. I did it, I guess, within one hour. Yeah, well done, Eric. Your presentation highlights the challenges and rewards of restoring aquatic ecosystems. <clears throat> and thank you for leading the charge. I'm sure there are questions by our audience members. So let's hear from you all. Hi, um, this is Sandy. Anderson, I had a question about what do the eels feed on when they're in Millbrook? Um, eels would actually feed on a lot of different things. The real small ones, they're gonna be eating little, um, little bugs in the water, um, little aquatic insects. And as they get older, they, um, I've actually fed eels myself as a kid. Uh, you can feed them minnows. Um, they'll, I don't, they'll eat other fish. So a big eel will, will eat sunfish. They'll eat other minnows. They'll eat bass. They'll eat pickerel. Uh, maybe not a big one because a big one's going to want to eat them. So they're, you know, they're, they're, they're targeting other animals in the system, but the real small ones are eating just little aquatic insects. But one thing I, I have a, a video that I thought of showing this evening, there's not time for it. But one thing you all have to keep in mind. One thing that baby eels really like to eat is mosquito larvae. Good. And stocks of eels are down so low everywhere that it's hypothesized that our increasing or ubiquitous mosquitoes could possibly be a, a, a byproduct of reduced eel stocks because the baby eels are not there eating the larvae. Um, I have a question. Um... So what about the eel's primary predators? I guess you mentioned the herons and the raccoons. Is that basically it? Yeah, it's a little, it's a little of everything. Um, well, it's probably humans. <laughs> humans are probably the primary. Um, uh, three focus areas from a human perspective. One is the baby eels that are sent to Asia to be grown out in aquaculture pens. Adult eels are harvested for food. Uh, years ago, they used to harvest extensively on the East Coast, and they would ship adult eels live, mostly to Europe, because almost Europe, many, if not all, European restaurants, eels is a big menu item. Mm -hmm. And then the and then the and then the um, the other market for eels is bait for striped bass fishermen. Mm -hmm. If you're fishing at nighttime for striped bass, what you want to use. Not that I, I don't use them, I don't advocate for it, but it works really good. Is a live American eel at nighttime is a way to catch a trophy striped bass. And, uh, and, and then it's lots of birds, kingfishers. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Have you found a correlation between the eel number and rainfall? I know that there, there was that really low number in 2016. As, and as I recall, it was, it was a drought year. Um, we do not, what I have, I have not seen a direct correlation between the overall precipitation during a year and our eel count in Rockport. Um, but what we absolutely do see is when we have a rain event, an individual rain event, a day or two after it, we will have a surge of eels go upstream. So this was actually a very dry year. We were a fairly good sized drought this year, but our eel count was up. And it was partly because we got a few rain events and they were down wading downstream and they made their way up. Good, good. So if anyone wants to see eels sometime uh, at the trap, you come down one day after a rain event. Don't go down the day of the rain event or the day before, go down the day after. There's often eels in the trap. I lived here that long. Well, remember um, in 
and maybe you might have gotten into it in braiding sweetgrass. There's this whole thing about the salmon. How do the salmon find their river? <laughs> I, just want to make sure. I see that Sharon Kashida said that 2121 might be a hard to get volunteers. Um, I, I'm sure she meant 2021, but actually, um, one of the very nice things about this project is it's pretty well socially distanced. You can just tell people to stay there six to eight feet away. Um, and it only takes one person to actually check the trap, which is kind of fun to be able to have an excuse. I know this past year, while we were all kind of cooped up or socially distanced, it was really refreshing to get out of the Mill Pond Dam, kind of be by myself, see people at a distance. I could put eels in the bucket, put them off to the side, let people look at them, then release them. And nobody had to get too close to each other. Well, thank you very much, Eric. This was very interesting. Super. Thank you, Francis. Yes. Uh, thank you, Eric. And um, unless there are further questions, uh, I guess we will close out our last scheduled talk in the series of presentation and, and activities hosted by the Rockport Earth Day 2020 subcommittee with a banner talk by Eric, uh, basically encapsulating uh, what it means to be on Cape Ann in, in, in a place which has lively ecosystems, which uh, merit preservation. Yeah. So, amen. amen. <laughs> Thank you so much, Eric. Keep great. Thank you. Down. Thanks for having me. Hey, everybody, Thank have you. a great holiday. Have fun in the snow tomorrow. Today was the, today was the misery day. Tomorrow's the day to go enjoy it. Yeah. Thank you, Eric. It was great. Thank you. Thank Learned you, Eric. A lot. Thank you all. Go well. Uh, Bye-bye. The Eric. recording great will be on uh, the, 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 the website at uh, the Conservation Commission and in um, Doc Waller's Earth and Space Report YouTube channel. I just have to make Thank it. Thank you, Doc. Yep. Take care. <laughs>